Thank you so much for the kind introduction and welcome. It's uh, it's a great pleasure, first of all, to be speaking at an event run by an organization that shares my commitment to engaging with the Australian community around big social issues. I think we need much, much, much more of this. We need much more discussion that brings together people who have different ideas and can bring different perspectives and experience to bear upon the nature of problems facing our society today. Um, so let me start, since I'm first, with a few little facts and figures just to set the stage about immigration. So right now, today, in Australia, this is the latest ABS data, we have about 7.5 million people here in Australia who are overseas born. That figure was 4.4 million in the year 2000. For natives, that uh, rise from 2000 to today is 14.6 million to 18.2 million. So overseas born are rising a little faster than the native born. So 30% of residents are born overseas in 2020. That was actually the peak. It's gone down a little bit since then, about 29.1%, I think, today. Net overseas migration dropped from about 200,000 to negative 100,000 in 2020 with the COVID crisis. Um, now it's almost recovered, that figure, although incoming migration has not. So that net overseas migration figure is not just incoming, it's also outgoing. So the COVID shortfall in net migration that you can calculate just by looking at what would have happened counterfactually had we not had the COVID crisis is about 350,000 to 400,000 migrants. Okay. The biggest drop has been temporary and student migrants. Okay. So the uh, other kinds of migrants, the permanent migrants, for example, hasn't been affected nearly as much. So. We were asked to kind of consider the impact of migration on the health of Australia. So uh, I'm going to offer a few remarks that have to do with the health of Australia and, and certainly either directly or indirectly have to do with immigration policy. The first thing to say is, of course, we have different types of immigration programs in this country. The first and most widely known and touted, and for good reason, is our skilled migration program. This is the one that employers participate in. They say, we need these skills and we can't find them in the domestic market. Um, and that includes also seasonal workers, people who need to pick fruit, for example, or vegetables, because of course we are a big produce producing country. And my read of the evidence is that importing those people, allowing in skilled migrants who are clearly needed according to the market signal seen by employers, and seasonal workers, because we don't have enough of them domestically, is basically almost entirely positive for the Australian economy and has very little negative uh, effect on domestic workers. So I don't really see much downside to having the skilled migration at about the same levels that we did pre-COVID and seasonal migration included in that. And I also think that for ethical reasons, a modest amount of humanitarian migration is also appropriate for a rich country like Australia. So we typically have had maybe 10,000 or so humanitarian um, migrants in a typical year, and I think that that's pretty appropriate. Now, let me turn to student migration. As mentioned by the, uh, the lovely lady who introduced me, um, I work at a university. So I have personal experience with the consequences of our student migration policy. And in fact, over 10 years ago now, I did a study that specifically asked the question of whether or not overseas students and non-English language speaking students were good for Australian education in a few ways. First, did they perform as well as domestic students? Secondly, did they impact negatively on learning in our classrooms, in tertiary education institutions in Australia? And thirdly, did they tend to inflate the grades that we were giving out at tertiary institutions? Um, unfortunately, what I found using the data that was from two universities at the student level across three years in the business faculties was that overseas students and non-English language speaking students did perform worse than domestic students to the tune of about five marks out of a hundred on average. And that when there's a larger fraction of overseas students in tutorials, the domestic students perform worse. When there's a larger fraction in the course, which you can identify separately when you have multiple tutorials in a course, so for large courses, then the more international or NESB students you have as a fraction of the total cohort, the higher their marks. I interpret that latter finding as evidence of great inflation. 
that happens because we don't exactly grade to a curve, but we do have administrative requirements to not fail more than X percent of people. I have been personally exposed to this, and I know many academics have had a similar experience. Um, and I also can say from my personal experience as a teacher, not just at UNSW, but also at a university in Adelaide, at which I worked for six years before coming to Sydney, that teaching a highly uh, linguistically diverse classroom, by which I mean a lot of students who have highly varying degrees of facility and fluency in English, is a very large challenge. There is always a temptation to not go as deeply or as abstractly in what you teach, because you know you're not going to be reaching as many students when you do that. I have attempted in my own teaching, and I know good teachers around the country who have done this as well, to bring in external supports to help my students to become better at English, but those supports are almost always inadequate for the very worst performers. And in my paper, which you can look up if you like, it's called The Impact of International Students on Measured Learning and Standards in Australian Higher Education, which was published in the Economics of Education Review in 2012, I talk about the reasons for these problems, which basically have to do with the uh, incentives of universities, the type of admission system that we have, uh, and the lack of oversight by academics onto that admission system. So, I think that student migration is basically too high and of too low quality students. And I've been actually been discussing and suggesting for many years that Australia has an amazing opportunity to develop highly intensive English immersion programs at a high price point for people from Asia who are well qualified but don't have English skills. I think we could do that. I think we could do it very well. And no university in Australia has actually taken up that cause. I'm, I have an idea about why, but if I were asked what should we do about student migration, it's to change our policies and our processes such that what we are doing is recruiting a smaller number of higher quality students, even when they need English language support, and when that's the case, offer them high quality immersion programs to bring, up, to bring them up to speed. Okay, the second, um, so the third point that I'll make is we often look to immigration, net immigration, to raise our population levels. People worry that, you know, we need more people and people just aren't having babies, so where are we going to get those babies? Well, let's, let's bring them in from outside. I guess my answer to that, the first answer that I have, is why are we not trying to do more to raise the native fertility rate if we are worried about this? <laughs> there are many things we could do to try to influence the native fertility rate, not just the baby bonus. Right, which was $3,000 to have a baby. I don't know if that would influence anybody in this room who's a parent to have another child. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the program is still running, unfortunately. Um, so one of the things that people don't often mention that I think has to do a little bit with this fertility problem is that there are many messages in today's culture that push men and women away from each other. Women are told in many, many, many ways in many fora that men are their enemies that the patriarchy is holding them down, that they are victims, um, and that they should see men as hostile to them. Um, they have rapacious, toxic, masculine tendencies, and, uh, and basically they are responsible for every ill that befalls a woman today. <coughs> These are falsehoods, <coughs> tragic falsehoods. Yeah. And they do not lend uh, a, a spirit of collaboration, cooperation, and a healthy vision for the future that would be good for Australia. The collaboration between the sexes is one of the most historically important collaborations in the species. And when we separate men and women, we are not only going to reduce fertility, we're also going to reduce happiness. Mm -hmm. The drivers of personal happiness, as found in the well-being literature, are very frequently, I mean, a large fraction of them, have to do with the establishment of long-term, sustained, intimate, joyful personal relationships, um, often between the sexes. So I think we need to stop with that messaging. I think we need to support our men and our boys in schools. Um, and I think we need to talk about how men and women can work together in the modern world without any strict requirements about one, what one sex must do uh, with an appreciation for the average differences between the sexes. Thank goodness we have those differences because how boring would the world be if we were all the same? And emphasize the possibilities of collaboration that that offers. Um, I also think we should promote the message that establishing strong families and having children early in life is a highly successful route to personal happiness. 
Um, it's something that we don't really hear, again, in the modern um, media and in educational facilities. Even parents don't tell their kids, hey, you know, when you're 20, you want to be getting on the dating market. Um, I had my kids very early in life, and uh, I'm so happy that I did. So many things are so much easier that way. And you spend more of your life surrounded by people you love. Yeah, uh, Who wouldn't want that? So we don't say that enough. I also think that we, as a society, have had a problem with childcare for a very, very long time. Government here radically overregulates childcare. And I think if we were to really want to help working families and encourage uh, families to have more kids and to feel comfortable that doing so is not going to trap one or the other partner at home, we could make childcare more accessible, more affordable, and just easier for families. Um, for example, family daycare is a format of daycare that exists only in a very, very small uh, fraction of daycare places in Australia, whereas in my country of birth, the United States, family daycare is everywhere. It's just not as highly regulated. It's much easier to get. You can literally go down the block to find some woman who's maybe in her 60s who has a few grown-up kids and wants to have six kids hanging around every day. It's a fun job for her. She likes the job. I even considered becoming a family daycare person when I eventually retire from the university because I love kids. In an alternative universe, I would have had eight kids. Um, but the opportunity cost is just too high. <laughs> but having looked into the red tape required in order to set up a family daycare, I'm kind of put off. We should also deregulate adoption. Adoption rates have declined 98% since the 1970s. We only have a few hundred now every year. We used to have in the thousands, almost 10,000 per year. Just imagine how many kids then are not being placed or staying in state care, which I can guess right now is not going to be great for those case development. Okay, fourth. I have basically five points, so we're almost at the end. I think we should also see uh, another avenue to increasing the skill base of the Australian workforce apart from just having immigration. We could, for example, focus more on how to upskill native Australian people, workers. One thing that we have uh, seen over the last, uh, certainly I've seen it very closely over the last 10 or 15 years, is it's pretty much impossible to crack into the curriculum setting bodies for our schools. I've tried to do that in relation to the economics curriculum, and it is a closed shop. It is not a body that is interested in actually teaching frontier critical thinking skills in economics to kids in high school. Um, and we need to change that. Our schools are not turfing out kids who really know a lot about important things. I was having lunch with my daughter just today who tutors, and she said, you know, I have to teach grammar now, and I never learned what an adverb is. How is that possible? <laughs> so she went to public school all her life. So we've got to do something about the curriculum. We've got to wrest it out of the hands of the people who are, have, have gotten into the state that it's in and bring in independent advice and, and have new approaches to schooling as well. Um, Community-based homeschooling, for example. We also, I think, should deregulate the secondary school and tertiary school sections. There's a lot more regulation there than we need, and we can draw uh, for inspiration on some of the models used in other countries, including the UK free schools model. I also think that we should promote TAFE and apprenticeships and other hands-on training as routes to high-income, respected careers. We seem to be fixated on this mono vision that only university is the path to success. Not true. Very much not true. I need a really good qualified plumber, thank you very much. Hard to find, because right? um, we just have this problem with the status, so we need to get over that, and, and government can help with that. Um, and also I will say that we do experience some brain drain. And that is also fixable through different policies than immigration. We have a problem with our productivity, which has been languishing for decades. And we also have a, an incredible amount of over bureaucratization which stifles innovation, and that drives really smart, educated people overseas. We've got to fix those problems. And that will help to upskill and raise the skill base of Australia, and we won't have to rely so much on skilled immigration. Finally, some people worry that having more immigrants will cause pressure on the uh, housing markets. Well, there are other solutions to that as well, apart from just blocking immigration, skilled immigration, which does, by the way, help employers in Australia to become more productive and be more um, competitive on the international scene. We can, for example, further constrain property developers to actually deliver the properties that they are uh, signed up to deliver, rather than holding them and being basically price makers, which they do, and then we have shortages. 
We could also engage in more social housing investment, not by having a housing fund, the way that's being um, talked about now, fund for a fund, just use the regular, already existing state-based social housing programs and fund them better. I think we could offer incentives to empty nest households to downsize. I think we should transition away from stamp duty to unapproved land tax, as per Henry George's famous prescription, which basically every economist in Australia agrees with. I also think we should probably consider a cap on investment property ownership, maybe one per family or one per individual. Uh, and I even think that we should think about an inheritance tax on assets. One of the big problems with housing is that if you happen to be in a, born in a rich family that already has a house, you'll be able to have a house. If you're not, you're probably not going to be able to have a house. That's a big problem. So if you tax assets above $2 million, for example, on inheritance, you would force some sales in order to get the liquidity in order to pay that tax. That would help to release some of those old money held houses to other people. I think that's all I'll say, apart from the fact that I myself am a skilled migrant. Um, and I recognize how valuable they are to the Australian economy. I think we do benefit from the diversity brought in, as long as we don't overdo it, and as long as we are mindful of, at the same time, the need to support our domestic population with policies targeted to fix our actual problems. Thank you.